I mean, Tim was 100% Irish, and somewhere it's Canadian Irish, which I don't really understand. And it was a shameful thing, I guess. I don't know. Let's not. To be, to be Canadian Irish? or <laughs> I Yeah, well, I because they were like, we're all pure blood Irish. And then there was something about being from Canada and oh. none of them would have any of it. And I, they wouldn't talk about it enough for me to really get the lowdown on the story. It was more That's of weird a... <laughs> because even if you're pure, I mean, like how many generations can that last? Like if you're living in Canada and you're, even if you have complete Irish heritage, like yeah, how long do you have to live in Canada before that becomes a taint? It's it's probably just one generation. Cause, nah, well, that's yeah. well. See, that's what I would think would be when it. But doesn't that just mean that like you're local and you know where the good bars are and stuff like that? Like that, <laughs> isn't that a good thing? Sure. You know what? None of them are here for us to ask them, so we'll just fill in their life story for them. The limey bastards. Well, no, the Irish aren't limey. Those are the Brits. <laughs> the limericky bastards. That's yes. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> I just abbreviated limerick to lime. Okay. Hey everybody, it's a Booze and Spirits podcast! It's like a drink with death! Woo! I get so excited saying it because I remember to say it, but at the same time I wasn't sure if that's what I was supposed to be saying, so I just went for it. That's fair. Uh, I'm Nick McDonald. And I am Mel. It's Mel! It's Mel! And there's no Katie, and I don't know why there's no Katie, but it makes me sad. Oh, she's just didn't have the time, it was too busy, and blah 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 blah. So. People with social lives, man. Uh, she doesn't have a social life. She has a baby. That's <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> they're diametrically opposed. <laughs> That's awesome. I think uh, it was an old Gallagher bit where he uh, symbolized a baby by putting a diaper on an anchor, <laughs> <laughs> shackled oh. it to his leg. <laughs> you want to go out tonight? We can't. We have a baby. Toss funk. <laughs> That is so true on so many levels, and I don't even have kids. <laughs> like, I think that's why I don't have kids, because I just, I was one of those few people who actually knew that these parent horror stories were the truth. But unlike a pet, most hotels can't tell you you're not allowed to bring it with you, so. That is true, but. Yeah, it's it's a give and take. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I don't think that's quite enough to jump me over the edge of actually no, it's fair. No, I, I get that. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone makes their own decisions. I get it. Right. Weighs their pros and cons. And yeah. curds and whey. Weigh your curds and whey. No? Okay. And a partridge in a pear tree. That's right. With some stank on it. Mm. First day of Christmas, my tree love gave to me. <laughs> partridge in a pear tree with some stank on it. <laughs> we may have we may have a new Christmas carol this year. Mm. We have to add like two babies. On rye bread with mayonnaise. <laughs> <laughs> babies, huh? Isn't that the same? Something like, uh, like that. Babies on rye bread with mayonnaise. Five babies in a blender. <laughs> well, we're very cheery today. Um, we really are. So I had to like listen through the whole last episode to remember that we decided we were doing Scottish ghosts this episode. <laughs> well, I could have told you that. I was the one who suggested it. I know you did, but like I was completely lost like Kate saw. Hey, what's the topic? I said, I don't know. I'm not to that part <laughs> of the episode yet. I have to figure it out. But we did Scottish ghosts. And we like did. I said, we have no Katie. She has well, no Scottish ghosts. And the whole reason that I thought of that was the two of you are Scottish, I guess. And it seemed like we were talking about that a lot over the last couple of episodes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a fair cop, but uh, she wasn't yeah. able to work it out. But we're here. Yeah. Got Scottish ghost. You got Scottish ghost? I do. And we never did check in to see if we have the same one. So that'll be interesting. I sure. I mean, I assumed that there was so many and <laughs> like they'd be obscure enough that we wouldn't both pick the same one. Did we both pick the Loch Ness Monster? No. Um, okay. I actually, I, <laughs> I looked up Scottish ghosts and 
I went to a top 10 and went in the middle so that I wasn't picking the very first one. Oh, you might have picked the one I didn't. Loch Ness Monster didn't even come up. Although, is Loch Ness Monster a ghost? Well, here's the thing. Here's why I bring that up. Like the other night, Kel sent me a Facebook post that was something about, hey, what if the Loch Ness Monster is just the ghost of a dinosaur? And like, I'll, I'll admit my head spun for a minute. Like, wait. That would make an awful lot of sense. Like, that why no one can ever... Wouldn't that make an incredible amount of sense? <laughs> with That's all the both problems? terrifying and really cool. Yeah. But no, I didn't do Loch Ness Monster. But it makes okay, a lot okay. of sense. Makes too much sense. More sense than I want it to make. So what did you f- come up with? Um, we both did. <laughs> <laughs> it's Craith's Castle in Bankery, Scotland. Okay, good. That wasn't what I did. Hot damn! Woohoo! What I did was I did the uh, ghosts of Glencoe. Should that mean something to me? I'm I'm, I'm, I'm not yet. I mean, it will gosh. it will when I tell it will when okay. I tell the story. Okay. Do you want to tell your story? Mine gets kind of long winded. Okay. Yeah, mine's pretty straightforward. It is. Got to put the glasses back on. Okay, Craith's Castle in Bankery, Scotland. It was built in the 16th century and home to the Burnett family. The Burnett family lived in the castle for over 350 years and has roots in the area dating back to 1323. Alexander Burnett built the castle in the 16th century. Uh, It has an intricate maze of turrets, towers, oak panels, and painted ceilings, many of which survive beautifully to this day. Inside, you'll find a labyrinth of cultural history. There are traces of the Burnett family everywhere at the Craiths. Their faces look down, captured forever in oil paintings while their family symbol, the ancient Horn of Lays, gifted to the family by Robert Bruce, hangs over the fireplace. There are many... Go ahead. I said neat. Yeah. I'm on board with with anything Robert Bruce. Are you? A lot of places had him listed as Robert the Bruce. Well, that's... He is Robert the Bruce. I just... What is a Bruce? Uh, you know what? I don't know. I haven't ever looked into it. I just assumed it was his name. Like... It's not Robert the Duke because Duke is a title, but the Duke because it's a name. I think it's just like Scottish slang for the ultimate bro. Nice. Like like he's not just a bro, he's a Bruce. Nice. Initially promulgated via the descendants of King Robert the Bruce, it has been a Scottish surname since the medieval times. It is now a common given name. Okay. That's it. (laughs) <laughs> he was he was he was the prototype for Bruce Campbell. That's why he was Robert. Bruce. <gasps> he wasn't a full Bruce Campbell, right. yet, but he was a prototype. Yes, he is the boss, <laughs> the boss, the Bruce. Uh, so lots of mysterious sightings in and around this castle. Uh, guides, castle guides have reported things feeling strange, like a chill down the back in an otherwise warm room, odd noises in an otherwise empty building, or a green mist floating across one of the rooms before it swept up a childlike ghostly figure and disappeared into the fireplace. Well, that's pleasant. Right? (laughs) (laughs) The castle's tower is said to be haunted by the White Lady. She is said to be Bertha, a lover of Alexander Burnett's. It was thought that she was poisoned by Alexander's mother for being unworthy of her son's hand in marriage. Visitors have also reported ghostly figures seen walking around the castle and its grounds which coincide with sudden and extreme drops in temperature. Another ghost said to frequent Craith's castle is that of Lady Agnes, who poisoned the son of her lover, Bertha, in the late 1500s and died suddenly after suspicion fell on her. (laughs) It couldn't be me. I'm dead. Right. (laughs) The capsule's most famous ghost is the green lady, who's seen wearing a green robe and cradling an infant in her arms. She's been spotted near a fireplace in a room which is now known as the Green Lady's Room. When the castle was renovated in the 1800s, it was reported that the bones of a child, presumably murdered, were discovered under the hearthstone of the fireplace. In a different report, it said that the bones of a woman and a child were found. In this one, the theory is that the bones belong to a servant impregnated by a member of the Burnett family, possibly in the 1600s with both mother and child killed to save the family's reputation. And, and then buried underneath the hearth. Yes. Because that's, that's where you hide your dead surf. <laughs> well, hey, it was like 200 years before they discovered this lady and her son. 
by that time, nobody had to off themselves. Is that the dead body version of, like, sweeping the dirt under the rug? It's like, I just put the corpse under the hearth, it'll be fine. (laughs) Maybe sweeping the dirt under the rug is just the ashes of your dead enemies. We can only hope. We can only hope. Although you don't, you don't want the ashes of your dead enemy in your house. That's that's just classless. Well, is it though? No, as it long is. As it's- my my story goes big into um, oh. killing your enemies within their homes. So, Ooh, we have a tie-in that we hadn't even planned on. <laughs> uh, so to wrap wrap things up, because it was a really short and sweet story. To give this story some clout, uh, Queen Victoria is counted among those who have witnessed the Green Lady in the castle. Uh, but the true identity of the Green Lady remains shrouded in mystery. Wee-hoo. Oh, wee oh! I've seen the Green Lady. Um, that was Envy on Inside Out. Oh, you're right. <laughs> Why I had a I thought of that movie the other day for absolutely no reason, and I that's weird that you mention it. All right. Well, like I said, I was doing the Ghost of Glencoe. Which, at which, you know, I was browsing ghosts, and I found this one. I thought this would be a good one, because, you know, we were talking about Katie and I are proud McDonald's, and we were talking about, you know, despite our Lord and, and Savior Jesus, Bruce Campbell, in general, the Scots don't trust Campbells as a whole. So this is a good story about some strife between the Campbells and the McDonald's. Nice. Yeah. Double whammy. Glencoe is an eight-mile-long glen. Its Gaelic name translates into the Glen of Weeping, which became very profound later on. So Glencoe is said to be haunted every February 13th, which is the anniversary of an atrocity that happened in 1692, which we will get into in a minute. Yeah, and There's lots of foreboding here. Weeping there's lots of the foreboding glen. here. There's <laughs> Atrocities. So into the, the history of Clan Donald. Later Clan MacDonald, later uh, 54 different clans is what we break down to. (laughs) So, for a long time, Clan Donald was a huge force amongst the clans, and uh, the the chief of Clan Donald was known as Lord of the Isles, which was a title that, although it swore fealty to Norway or Ireland or Scotland at various times throughout history, the Lord of the Isles was pretty much allowed to operate mostly independently. And do his own damn thing because nobody wanted to climb up the mountains and fuck with him to begin with. Nice. Fast forward to 1493 when King James IV of the Scots stripped the chief of his title, which was kind of the mark of Clan Donald's descent. For the next 200 years, their lands and titles were kind of systematically carved up and handed over to their neighbors, the Campbells. Which this goes back to the whole Campbells selling out the Scotch to the Brits, blah, 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 blah. The Campbells and the Donalds were held at an enmity. An enmity. I'm saying my. I'm, well, I'm saying my own typos as I look at them. <laughs> <laughs> enmity. Enmity. Is that the right word? Maybe I shouldn't use this word. Held in an enmity. <laughs> held at an Eminem TV store between them that the British government regularly exploited. Uh, basically just to keep them at odds with each other and, as part of a larger scheme, keep all the clans from creating imbalance and power within them, or even worse, uniting against the English crown. Yeah, because that would be terrible. Overthrow them fuckers. A lot of big, burly, angry Scots. That's it's something you care. You, tr- you pretty much want to avoid if you can. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I'm England. The McDonald's of Glencoe, uh, also known as the McKeans, had lived in the Glencoe area since the 14th century, the time of Robert the Bruce. Uh, But after the Donald's descent, they effectively lived on land that they didn't really own anymore. So it it made the Campbells their landlords, which, you know, caused all sorts of strife. And the McKeons were no angels themselves. They They dirty uh, squatters. Well, they weren't squatters, but they they were known to be uh, cattle thieves, cattle rustlers. (laughs) And they often got into fights with the neighboring clans, especially the Campbells. And due to the law at the time, a landowner would be held liable for losses caused by men living on his land. So for the Campbells, it was a headache because the McKeons would go steal some cattle. And then someone would say, hey, the McKeons stole my cattle. And then we'd go to Campbell's to complain. And Campbell had to pay up to replace the cattle because it was people living on his land. Ooh. Well, fuck the Campbells. Anyway, in uh, <laughs> in the late 17th century, 
England was in the middle of a big religious turmoil. James the Seventh had started sidling up with several of the Catholic leaders, put them into special offices, things like that, which enraged the Protestant population. And the end result was it got James the Seventh ran out of England, <laughs> where he fled to France and took shelter with Louis the Fourteenth. James's Protestant daughter, Mary, uh, and I forgot to look up if this was like the quote unquote Mary Queen of Scots. I'm not sure if it's that Mary or not. Mm. Anyway, his daughter Mary, um, and her husband, William of Orange, took over the English and Scottish thrones in his absence. Mm -hmm. The supporters of James were known as the Jacobites, and we kind of covered a little bit of this, I think, back in the uh, St. Patrick's Day episode. We kind of touched on some of the outer skirtings of this whole conflict. So the Jacobites were suffering major defeats all over the Isles, but there was common knowledge that many of the Highland clan chiefs were Jacobites, so... They could bring in swarms of men at a moment's notice if so inclined. Again, don't piss off the big burly Scots in the Highlands <laughs> if you can avoid it. Yeah. William of Orange didn't want to do that because he was already having a hard enough time controlling the areas in the south, fighting off the Flemish and... Uh, the Flemish? The Flemish. The Flemish? The Flegum. The Flegums. So he offered kind of a communal bribe of 12,000 pounds to be split among all the Highland clan leaders who would agree to change their alliance. Oh. <laughs> so it was like, here's 12,000 pounds. Anyone who signs up, divvy it up among yourselves. And uh, anyone who doesn't want any part of it, I'm gonna get you. Did household heads or heads of clans start offing other heads of clans? And taking on their clans so that they could have a bigger piece. Because, I mean, 12,000 pounds back then was probably, like, a shit ton of money. But yeah, it only goes so far. No, well, I mean, I, had, I didn't see any stories about that. Yeah. I feel, in general, the clans respected one another. They'd fuck with each other, but they weren't really trying to go to war with one another if they could avoid it. That's fair. Um, William of Orange uh, assigned John Campbell of Brittlebane to deliver the message. So he gathered the Highland chiefs together. It kind of became clear over these talks that McKean of Glencoe was not going to get any of the money the way the negotiating was going. <laughs> but Campbell of Breadalbane promised them that they'd kind of overlook some of the cattle thievery fees that they were still owed if they joined in on the whole situation. Still, the Jacobite chiefs were pretty skeptical. So John Campbell promised that the treaty would only be good so long as James VII was gone. And as soon as he set foot back on England, we could rip it up and everything could just go back the way it was. Which <laughs> which the, the, the Highland Chiefs were, you know, they thought that was okay. But they still were kind of iffy on it until they got the okay from King James himself. Mm -hmm. So they sent off a letter to France asking James for his advice on the Highland Treaty. Meanwhile, uh, William of Orange had placed a deadline on signing this treaty. Uh, January 1st, 1692. So now we got to race against time because they got to get the letter off to James and get a response back from James and everyone's got to decide if they're going to sign or not before the deadline hits up. And this is where John Dalrymple comes in. He's the master of stare. Dalrymple is kind of another nefarious figure in Scottish history. He was a major, major player in Scottish Parliament and he was kind of a two-headed snake. He served under James but had no qualms about helping William rise to power, and for which William rewarded him with even more power and made him Lord Advocate and Joint Secretary of State for Scotland. Another another key factor in this whole relationship is that Dalrymple was a very proud lowlander and despised the Highlanders, considering them all to be uncivilized barbarians. Ooh, so, <laughs> lowbrow. Yeah, so... He was pretty excited for the opportunity that some of these chiefs might not follow through on the treaty, and then he could go make an example of them. Mm -hmm. In anticipation, he sent some troops forward to Fort William near Glencoe, just so they had some men ready to crack some skulls should the need, or should the need, should the opportunity, <laughs> rather, arise. <laughs> Let's crack skulls. <laughs> Back in France, James VII realized he was hosed. Louis XIV did not want to give him the men in arms that he was going to need to take back his throne. It was just too much of an ask. So he went ahead and he sent word back to the Highland chiefs to take William's offer for their own good. His reply reached Edinburgh on December 21st, 1691. Plenty of time. Well, yeah, they got about 10 days. Um, it passed through the clans until it reached Glengarry. Glengarry, Glen Ross, Pepsi Challenge, took it lost. <laughs> just Glengarry, just Glengarry. 
coffee was not for closers. And <laughs> in typical Highland bravado, Glenn Gary decided to detain the messenger for several days. Basically, as like I said, they like to fuck with each other, giving the chiefs of Loch Lale and Kepik only 24 hours to sign the treaty <laughs> and giving Glencoe no possible way to respond to the treaty at Inverary in time, where they were supposed to register. So, McGeehan got the message, and realizing he couldn't make it to Inverary, he went to Fort Williams and met with the fort governor there because he wanted to report, hey, yo, I'm on board. Everybody, you know, can we get, and can I get a letter that says I'm on board so that, you know, everyone knows that I was here even though I wasn't there right. <laughs> saying I'm on board? The governor said fine, and he gave him a number. He told McGeehan, you know, regardless, report to Inverary as soon as you can. Where's a telegraph when you need one? Right. So McKeon's heading for Inverary, but to do it quickly, they had to cut across Campbell property to take a direct route. Son of a bitch. Campbell caught McKeon and held him for trespassing, <laughs> delaying their <laughs> arrival. Um, like I said, he did have the letter, so eventually Campbell did let him go, but they, you know, held on to him, fucked with him, so that they couldn't arrive until January 2nd, which God was past the deadline. Damn it. And then when they got there, uh, the... Uh, Inverary, the sheriff, another Campbell, Colin Campbell, was not present, so they had to wait three more days for him to return before they could <laughs> give him the letter that said, hey, we're on board, we're okay with this, we're, we're doing it, we're doing it, we're signing the thing. So, Colin Campbell arrives, days later, they, he accepts the letter from Fort Williams, and McKeon goes home, thinks everything's wrapped up, we're all copacetic, tish tosh, we got it all taken care of. So when the paper, uh, the, when the packet of papers reached Edinburgh, the Privy Council decided they were going to remove Glencoe's name from the collection, citing they only signed it on a technicality, which you know was much to the delight of Dalrymple. There are several clans that refused to sign the treaty, but only poor McKean of Glencoe was small enough that they could you know actually move against him and make an example of. The other ones were too big and powerful. <laughs> so a regiment was sent to Glencoe from Argyll, led by another Campbell. <laughs> led by Robert Campbell of Glen Lyon. Okay, Glen Lyon is a really fucking cool name. <laughs> Robert was a was 60 years old and had never advanced past the status of captain. He was a heavy drinker and a gambler, and he'd managed to piss away most of his family's inheritance. He was pretty much just considered a, a general failure at life all ways around. So, is it noteworthy that this what this guy was called out as a heavy drinker, considering his heritage? Uh, I think it was just. I think it was just a matter of he just had the appearance. I mean, I mean, they're all Scottish, right? He just had. <laughs> I mean, I'm trying to say it without saying it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But he had an appearance of patheticness more so than a lot of other individuals. So, oh, so he couldn't hold his drink. Well, it was just he just kind of was a sad, you know, <laughs> disrespected, bless their heart yeah. type of figure. Oh. So this poor pathetic captain shows up to to Glencoe. He tells them all that they're on their way to Glengarry to collect unpaid taxes. So the McKeon said, "Okay, well, you know that makes sense, and it's it's you know dipshit Robert Campbell here." So it's not like he's going to, you know, <laughs> we know that nobody trusts him to do anything serious. So what happened was as the uh, weather bore down on him and approached the McKeons, the McDonald's of Glencoe, they took these soldiers and regiments into their homes. They he said, you know, you can camp out with us and stay with us until the weather passes so you guys can get back on your way. Now. Highland tradition has a huge, huge amount of value in hospitality. And once you took another under your roof, friendship was just assumed, like like signed, sealed, delivered, assumed. There was no way that if you gave someone that level of hospitality, they would ever lift a finger against you. Oh. On the night of February 12th, during the blizzard, Robert Campbell was given an order by a messenger at 5 a.m., him and his men were to slay every McDonald of Glencoe under 70. Women, men, children, uh, and specifically the chief and his sons. And Campbell and most of his men did as ordered. They attacked the McDonald's from within their own homes, killed several of them in their beds. By sunup, 38 of the McDonald's were dead, including Chief McKeon. Uh, many others ended up dying of exposure as they fled into the mountains during a blizzard to get away, including McKeon's wife. 
there's no exact count on how many people were, uh, how many people died that day, but it's somewhere between 40 and 300. Motherfucker. Yeah. Like I said, there's a huge, huge tradition of hospitality among the, the Scots and, you know, murder's always been a really heinous crime, but they have uh, murder under trust, which is even more heinous. And that's a term specifically for a situation like this, where someone took you into your home and then you went ahead and killed them anyway. It's just one of the harshest sins that a person could ever commit. Yeah. So the order for this massacre was, of course, signed by Lord Advocate Dalrymple. <laughs> Um, and the whole plot was conceived by two officers, Major Duncanson and Lieutenant Colonel Hamilton, and they specifically chose Robert Campbell for his apparent weakness of character. And on top of that, if they give the order to him, then the Campbells get to take the blame for going around and massacring everybody. And it's, you know, they can call it, oh, it's another feud between the Campbells and the McDonald's instead of, oh, this was a military action performed by our own government. Right. Dalrymple was not satisfied, though. He ordered that the two surviving sons of McKeon's five, the other three had all died, that they be hunted down and either killed or sent off to the plantations. But by this point, the foulness of the whole deed had sat so poorly with the rest of Scottish society uh, yeah. that nobody took any effort to carry out that order. Everyone kind of said, fuck you, you've, you've gone too far already. Campbell of Brettlebane panicked. He was the one who got all the chiefs together, and he figured that they would think he was in on it mm -hmm. and would be held accountable for the betrayal. So he immediately wrote a letter to uh, the McDonald's begging for exoneration from the act. Um, he Unfortunately, he never received a reply to that effect. Whammy. Robert Campbell of Glenlian was haunted by his actions. He was already a drunk, but he began drinking even more, and in one drunken stupor, accidentally left the order papers that he was given behind in an alehouse, where journalists discovered it and had it sent to the Paris, and the Paris Gazette printed <laughs> the story and uh, distributed it around Europe, which shocked the entire continent at that point. So now the entire continent is saying, what the fuck is happening over there in Scotland that mm -hmm. they're just killing people that took them into their house? A couple inquiries were made, investigators interviewed witnesses and uh, looked through the paper trail. Parliament just kind of waved it off as a Jacobite conspiracy, but uh, soon Queen Mary herself began asking questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so they had to look a, bit, a little bit deeper. They never found anything during her life, but after her death during a second inquiry, it was concluded that an act of treason had indeed been enacted upon the people of Glencoe by their own government. William was able to finagle things so that he was declared innocent. McKeon's signature being removed from the treaty was considered a, air quote, mistake. Mm. <laughs> and, and Dalrymple was found to have, air quote, misinterpreted the king's wishes <laughs> by signing the order. Uh, he was dismissed from his post as Secretary of State, but he soon found his way back into office because, you know, it's politics. And once you slap them on the wrist and give people time to forget about it, then you can just go back to doing whatever you're doing before. And he shouldn't have had the position anyway because he was well, put there by a crony. Yeah, exactly. After William's death in 1702, Dalrymple was instrumental in developing the Union of the Crowns, which even today is considered by many Scots to be the second betrayal he perpetuated against <laughs> Scotland. Robert Campbell and his men were found guilty of murder under trust, despite acting under the orders of superiors. It was recommended they stand trial, but they never did. It was, also, it was also recommended to William that Duncanson and Hamilton be made to answer questions, uh, but the king declined to uh, pursue such a line. In the end, none of the men responsible were really punished. Most were pardoned by the king. One became a colonel, another a knight, a third a peer, and the fourth an earl. So they all kind of got rewarded for their bullshit. Wow. Yeah. Glencoe itself in the winter, has kind of a mysterious quality to it. The low-lying sun in the mountains and evaporating frost in the grass gives it kind of an eerie, mystical feel. Every year on February 13th, the Donald Society of Edinburgh lays a memorial wreath in the village of Glencoe in remembrance of the massacre. The We should go to there. We should go to there. I agree. 
The morning of February 13th is when real interesting things begin to happen, though. I love how I just invited myself to your family's thing. That's fine. We're going we're to go do a thing. We're going to go do a thing. Uh, visitors to Glencoe on the anniversary of the massacre report seeing fugitive clansmen hiding in the crags, trying to avoid the marauding soldiers. Some have even claimed to see the massacre reenacted or hear cries of the victims carry across the wind. Some stories claim that the massacre would have been worse were it not for the Quinyag. The Quinyag is a wailing spirit, kind of in the same family as a banshee, mm-hmm. but she's invisible to humans. Uh, but she announces herself with the same kind of heart-stopping wails. Legend tells that hearing her cry by at night by a waterfall is a portent of calamity approaching the clan. And some say that her wail signaled the clan and caused many of them to escape the Campbell's steel. And others say that her wailing can still be heard in the area. So if I am just happen to be wa- by a waterfall, and I just happen to hear a heart-stopping wail of any kind. Mm-hmm. What do I run? Do I um, bury myself I, in the in the sand for a little bit? I don't think I don't <laughs> think the Quinia comes after individuals. I think it's more just like a, a scary warning. Is the idea? Should I tell somebody? Should I call a priest? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe you should uh, warn any relatives against any dangerous acts they were thinking of. <laughs> Do not commit any dangerous acts. Blanket. Do not have overnight guests for the next week or so. That is very good advice. As a matter of fact, I just won't have overnight guests for the foreseeable future. (laughs) Well, those are stories. I think Katie is still, I think Katie's working on a drink for this one, um, which we will plug in shortly. So we don't have to worry about that. Nice. We will put it here. your oh. Scottish ghost stories? We did. Were they good? Uh, exciting? Were they in Scotland? What happened? They were in Scotland. We did an episode, okay? <laughs> that good, huh? <laughs> I don't know. Mine was more of a history lesson, but... <laughs> Shocker. Mel's was brief and to the point. Mine was a history lesson. How many times was Supernatural referenced? None. I don't think I don't think we mentioned it one time. Is Mel okay? Yeah. Are you sure? I feel oh, like shit. that's a silent cry for help. She didn't <laughs> mention supernatural. Uh, did they? I guess they did go to England in one of the, like one of the later seasons, didn't they? But I didn't see that season. I don't know. I really liked the first season, and then I just kept watching, even though I was like, I don't care about this angel demon battle. I liked everything up until when they closed the gates of hell and they saved the world, and then they had to keep doing all the same stuff, regardless. Yeah. I like but you know what that the, sees you know if you go up to whatever four or five that was then like it's still a pretty solid show and then everything after it's just kind of bonus for and, anyone who wants it then there's like seven more seasons yeah but the things in the later season don't undo anything from those first few so it's okay. fine I haven't made it that far <laughs> at least as far as I know I, yeah I don't think I watched like the last two or three seasons all right you're gonna you're gonna have to come up with a name for this because I was not involved with the recording of this episode i already i already predicted what my name would be and we'll see if i'm right or not was that before did i tell you what my drink idea was no you 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 asked me if you had ever done this kind of drink did i do that before you named it yes so i had a little i had a little bit of a of a preview but i don't know maybe you didn't do that drink i don't know um all right so you're doing scottish ghosts Mm-hmm. I'm cold, <laughs> and I like to drink whiskey, so we're going to do a hot toddy. Hot toddy. Hot toddy. Check it and see. Got a fever of cat. What are you doing here? Just play with this. <laughs> That's not how I remember that song at all. <laughs> <laughs> it's the remix. So, to be perfectly honest, I like to do my hot toddies with Baron Yeager bourbon which is a honey liqueur fused with a bourbon that is a, might be off the market. It's become very hard to find. I like to use that. And then regular bourbon. I mean, would any other honey bourbon be? I'm except, getting, I mean, because I'm, I'm getting, sh- right. getting there. Sorry. This is, um, I'm trying to make it a conversation. It's conversational. It's, it's, it's. Okay. Okay. Um, 
And then I also really like to add to my hot toddy a splash of hot monkey pepper vodka, which is out of Portland. I've tried it with other pepper vodkas. The hot monkey is really the one. But that just like, it's just enough heat to just like whoosh, clear your sinuses. It's great stuff. But we're in Scotland, so I'm not going to do that. Obviously, I need to use Scottish whiskey. And I'm not going to pretend I am a scotch expert. I did try to attend a couple of scotch and cigar events one time because I wanted to learn more about scotch. Mm -hmm. But I would worry about scotch and a hot toddy, but continue. At this event, these events, I um, rage quit because money does not buy class. And I do not like being called sweetheart having my hand, like men put their hands on me while I'm serving them. And, you know just treating me like is this is that how bottle girls in vegas live their lives i just i don't <laughs> and then they didn't tip well and i'm like you, no no like i'm not actually working this event stop talking to me like you own me um, i tipped you in compliments yeah, those pay the bills so well anyway so uh I tried to learn more about scotch in the past. I have, so I'm not like fluent in scotch as I would like to be, but uh, I did a little research because I'm like, mm, I just don't like things that taste smoky that aren't smoked. I don't like mm. a lot of smoky things anyway. Like I don't like Chipotle. Like that being said, I did, I did some research and not all of the scotches apparently are peaty, smoky, burny tasting. See, that's, that's, what not even, that's not even what I think of when I think of scotch. That must just be like a modern thing. What I think it's think? I think it's scotch tasting like wheat grass most of the time. <laughs> what scotch did you taste? I don't even remember. It was I, it was like high school. I don't remember. Okay, so it's something someone like found in the back of a closet, I'm guessing. No, that's not true. People have bought me scotch before. I don't know. It so, always it always tastes a little bit like a meadow to me. So maybe you were drinking lowland scotch, which is apparently more floral. Oh. Which I think will pair better in this hot toddy. And I think for this hot toddy, I mean, I'm I'm pretty traditional that you just use lemon and honey and whiskey and hot water. But I think I'm gonna do like uh, maybe some chamomile tea. Maybe, maybe something. I'm gonna. I gotta taste the scotch first, mm -hmm. and make sure that's gonna that's gonna pair. Yeah. Yeah. So that's my plan. It's gonna be like a a florally scotch toddy. All right. It's not super exciting, but you were going with like you know kind of a traditional thing. All right. And the name that I predicted ahead of time, the Scott toddy. The Scott toddy. Yeah. Yeah. Seems the most obvious choice, right? Yeah, with us. <laughs> Mui creative. Yeah, well, you know, I do my best. Wow, Katie, that sounds like a really delicious drink. It really did. It sounded great. I'm going to call it right now. She's making a Scott toddy. <laughs> Oh boy! I could be completely wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it's on tape now. You pretty much yeah. It's, it's got it it's got to happen now. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess we should look at the next episode. Um, so the next episode should I mean, if we do a Thanksgiving episode, the next one will be that slot. Oh, so but I don't know what to do for Thanksgiving. You've you've never done like specifically. Native American ghosts or like indigenous creepy stories specific, like not, you know, not setting out to do those. No, that's never like, you know, been mm -hmm. a directive goal. I mean, we've had several. There's yeah. Like it, the, the stories just sort of naturally end up in the spiritual realm. Uh, yeah. Cause they're very spiritual people, but it, it seems like that's the obvious cliche fit for Thanksgiving. I was thinking we could do like um, ghosts about, paper carve outs of turkeys like that shape the cans really i've <laughs> i've never even considered that as a possibility what kind of <laughs> what kind of ghost would haunt my paper bags exactly not your paper bags like a paper hand like you know when you make the turkey and you draw it around your hand and oh 
Usually those yeah. ended up on like a like a sack lunch paper bag so that you could make it into oh, a puppet. They? Well, th- oh no no no, that's a different thing. That's a that's a no. I'm talking about when you put your hand. No, I know exactly what you're talking about because oh, okay. these are the things and this is the hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But look inside and see all the people. Yeah. Well, Native American is a good uh, a good thought. Or we probably should have done that for Indigenous Peoples Day, but didn't have the foresight. Um, yeah. Another thing that I was thinking was possible would be, you know, because we're killing turkeys, maybe ghost animals, but... You know, we keep threatening to do something about, like, hellhounds and devil dogs and whatever. Should we pick one? Should we say either or? Either or? What do you want to do? Well, of course I'm going to vote for my idea, but I feel okay. like well, I picked we're doing the last idea, one. <laughs> well, you did pick the last one, but that's, you know... There's no rules here, I don't think. Hot damn. I love it when there's no rules. <laughs> I do what I want, motherfuckers. That's right. Yeah. Fucking suck it. Suck it. America. Um, so Cards Against Humanity sent me an email about a pack about climate change, and they give you a discount on your pack based on how fucked you are when climate change hits your zip code. Um, oh. my zip code is pretty fucked, which gave me a 25% discount, but apparently you can get up to a 50% discount, which means that other areas within the world are going to be much worse off, which makes sense. Cause really Oregon yeah. is not that far off from being carbon neutral. What would all, with all the trees or whatever. Well, I, I kind of figured it was more like an idea of like when the ocean level rises. <laughs> oh, that's true. We are. I don't know. I don't know how they, how <laughs> they designated that. <laughs> You know, like, every tribe in the area has a story about basically tying a canoe in a tree so that when the waters rise, you can just get in your canoe and be safe. That's clever. It is. Um, it's... I'm I'm very much anticipating seeing a bunch of hillbillies tying speedboats and <laughs> to the top of their trees in the near future. Nice. Gotta be prepared. Yeah. We're prepping for the end of the world. So, uh, Katie and I will be shooting later this week. I don't know when we'll release it. Hopefully not too long. We will be shooting a new Bad Decisions Club. Hot damn. The the one we've been teasing for a while. You haven't really heard what it was, have you? Because like, you kept having bad internet. I you never did it. hear what it was. Katie found out from the TikToks. You know when you return something to Amazon or Walmart, like online? You know, not go to the store, but like when you return it via UPS or mail or whatever. Yeah. Like it doesn't go back to Amazon or Walmart. What they do is they sell it to, like, this warehouse. There's one in California. There may be some other ones. Where these people buy just packages. They don't know it's in the package. <laughs> they buy the packages. They throw them on a pallet. And then they sell those pallets to, like, people who resell them on eBay. Oh, God. What have you done? <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't buy a pallet. <laughs> but we did find out that you can buy parcels of, like, 10 or 15 of these unopened mystery packages at a time <laughs> oh my god <laughs> so katie and i each bought a, a parcel of mystery return mail that we're going to unbox and open and see what we got that was our <laughs> and we figured that that qualified as a bad decision club as much as anything does <laughs> very much so like i I've, I've been doing this whole like marie condo joy of yeah, decluttering yeah. whatever i can't think of it and so, like, something like that just gets my blood pressure going up because <laughs> I'm trying so desperately to get all the superfluous crap out of my house. Fair. That's very fair. I understand that. <sighs> I keep trying to get all the crap out of my house, but um, we have two theater people that live here. And a theater person won't ever throw anything away because they're, well, maybe I can use that for a show later. <laughs> yeah, I, I used to be the granddaughter of depression era people who like (laughs) literally literally my grandfather would find a nail or a screw in good condition on the ground and pick it up and say hey i can use this take it home put it in his toolbox and use it kel's aunt got put in facebook jail for a hot second because she posted some meme about the economy about y'all are about to find out why your grandma saved bacon grease and washed tinfoil here pretty soon (laughs) But the thing is, she got put in Facebook jail for it, and it had one of those, like, fact checkers at the bottom, and it said, false, there's no evidence that anybody ever washed aluminum foil to reuse, and I'm going, are you fucking kidding me? Everyone knows that's Uh, happened. yeah. I, 
I know old people who won't throw away wrapping paper. They very, very carefully open it and unfold it so that they can be reused. My So Tim used to wash every single Ziploc bag he used so he could mm-hmm. reuse it until he couldn't yeah. use them again. Exactly. It would drive me crazy, but <laughs> he was like a total conservationist now that I think mm-hmm. about it. So, yeah, yeah no. <laughs> I, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. All right. We should probably wrap this thing up. Um, this is usually the part, let's see, where my notes say I'm supposed to say, hey, teaser for the next episode, we do that. Hey, check out our show notes. Hey, check out our our socials and check out our YouTube and check out our Patreon. And i kind of given up on all of those things. T Public. T Public. Do you still do oh, that? Oh, I did put up a new, I did, I did do a new shirt. <gasps> you did? There is a new shirt. Up, yes. It's, um, I, and this is my opportunity to announce to everyone that uh, Booze and Spirits podcast is now selling NFTs. Oh. Yeah, we put up on the Tee Public. It's a t-shirt with a big N and a big F on it. So you can go to our merch store and buy your own NFT and show everybody that you now own, that you're now in the NFT market and you have your own NFT. <laughs> Come on, I'm a, I'm a freaking genius, that okay? Is, Come on. That is very clever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you want to tell people to drink responsibly and in accordance with their local laws? I would like to tell them not to end up being our next ghost. That would be You make a, spectacular. an excellent point there. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. Yeah. I don't gotta do that. Well, I probably should do it, though. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Goodbye, everybody. We'll be back with nonsense soon. Okay, I love Hopefully, you. Bye-bye. We'll have an episode that's not late at some time in the near future. If we want to. Yes, we want to. Yeah. <laughs> Make no promise.